do the lab, it, it's an easier coursework than, say, this coursework or the coursework I, I tend to give out to research methods the way I think about it. It's not, not the deepest coursework. Um, okay. So this week, uh, um, I'm going to try to get a, a feel for how people talk about genetic algorithms. So uh, I'm going to, uh, you know, basically today discuss the schema theorem. Uh, this is to kind of give some intuition in, in Holland's uh, motivation for why GAs may work. And then we'll also discuss the NFL theorem, which is perhaps uh, uh, a simple result uh, saying something that perhaps gives us some perspective on what we could hope from, from any optimization algorithm. Then um, we'll proceed to influential applications. Here I've chosen three applications that are influential in the sense that uh, they, they have a lot of kind of ideas in them. Um, in the sense that they, and these ideas are, are things that other people have tried to incorporate and then use to build on in some fashion. Um, so they're kind of going beyond just a simple GA applied to a knapsack problem. They're, they're some ideas with, with, which have influenced people. Um, okay, so reviewing, uh, Thinking of a GA as an adaptive system, um, the key thing about uh, a GA as an adaptive system is that it's something that balances exploration versus exploitation. I'm getting all the notes all the time. Uh, So as, as a system that um, balance exploration versus exploitation, uh, you'd be thought of as a prototypical algorithm for exploration, something like random search. Exploitation is taking advantage of the solutions that you have already, and this is perhaps still timing or gradient descent. Uh, exploration, you know, the, in some sense in the GA is, is we're moving around in the space. There's a little bit of perhaps exploitation in the sense of a mutation crosser in the sense that we try to stay by a solution which is nearby, but deciding where we particularly uh, look nearby is in this selection step. Uh, we don't choose any one of our solutions and randomly mutate them or cross over because if we did that and we just and we didn't have any selection step, uh, the GA would become pure random search of some type, but perhaps some biasness in the randomness, but it basically ignores the, the properties of the landscape if we only have these two operators. Whereas if we include selection, we're somehow now exploiting the properties of the landscape. Okay. Holland's vision about the genetic algorithm didn't necessarily have to do strictly with optimization. It was more about, think about thinking about a, a system that lived in an environment that was adaptive and uh, adapted to its environment as it moved around. And to model this, um, of course, the way we mostly use a GA now is actually in terms of optimization that we focus on, but the uh, we'll, we'll still use uh, Holland's argument to understand uh, where a GA is supposed to be good. Okay, so one, one way to, to model this balance trade-off between exploration and exploitation is the bandit problem. Uh, here you imagine you have maybe <coughs> two uh, fruit machines which 
you can play, and maybe they're in your favor. Uh, you just don't know which one has the better payoff. And the idea is, well, if you're given a set of, a limited set of coins, and you have these two slot machines to play, you want to maximize your payoff, how should you maximize uh, your payoff? So, um, you know, an example of this is in uh, online advertising. Um, do a fair amount of research here at UCL on this problem. Okay, so the specific model where uh, Holland uh, proved some results was by uh, assuming uh, that the slot machine had some payoff rate whose, whose uh, payoff uh, corresponded to uh, the draw from a, a Gaussian distribution. Um, where these two Gaussian distributions, one for each slot machine, are defined by some unknown mean and some unknown variance. So as we discussed last time, um, then the, the model that we set up for doing this is, is, is the following. Um, you want to decide which is your, your, your better place to take a, a risk on. So we'll explore for some small end trials, i.e. over these small end trials, we'll maybe try each arm twice, okay? Or each arm once for each of, for every two trials, we can try each slot machine. And then after those small end trials, we'll look at perhaps a slot machine that had the best payoff over that period of time and then go ahead and play the arm that was better then. Um, and so there's trade-offs involved if we choose <coughs> n very small or n very large. What's the problem if we set small n to be small? No, no, no. You, you don't learn anything. You get lots of time to exploit the results, but you know you're, you, there's a chance that you may be making a bad decision. And just the opposite side here: if we make large and very well, we may be much more confident in which arm is better. But we've been uh, evenly playing our money between the machines, and so we're going to have a hard time. We're not going to have as many coins with which to exploit. I've, I've described this problem quite softly, and there's a number of potential details on how you could set up such a model, and they could lead to potentially different uh, results. But the uh, way, way uh, Holland set up the value is, uh, we'll say n star is the max, is the optimal value for the length of exploration. Uh, i.e., do we play one trial, two trials, n over k trials? How many trials should we, we pay? Well, to maximize payback uh, in the exact parameters of the model that Holland uh, considered, the result that he was the following is that we should set small n so that uh, roughly uh, small n, the, the exponent of it should equal n minus n star. In other words, uh, we should exploit uh, exponentially longer than we explore. How does this relate to GAs? Um, well, what, what Holland wants to, where we're going is as follows. Um, If you consider uh, a GA, you have this population-based search. Uh, clearly, some solutions are in a worse part of the space than other parts of the solution. But maybe these solutions are in a worse part of the space, they have a lower fitness value. It turns out that their uh, maxima happen to be by, by these worse solutions rather than the larger solution. You know, it's worthwhile to explore a little bit. Um, And Holland, 
home, we'll refine this a little bit with the notion of schema rather than individuals in the population. But the, the overall final claim it will be that, uh, in essence, uh, the GAs spend exponentially more time in exploitation than exploration, um, at least looking at things under strong assumptions. And if you believe the analogy from the bandit problem to a search problem, if you think that's potentially relevant, um, then that's a good thing to do when GAs do it. This is, is the big picture of Holland's argument. Okay. There's some more detail to it, to this though. Uh, Colin wants to think of the, the search that a genetic algorithm is performing is in some sense more parallel than just the individuals. That we should not look at search as a property of the individuals, but of the traits of the individuals. Uh, to, to understand what Holland is thinking of as a trait, uh, it's necessary to understand the schema. Okay, so a schema, Holland, so right now we're, we're considering binary uh, strings. A schema is as follows. You express it with uh, three symbols, uh, zero, one, and star. And for those of you who are familiar with regular expressions, uh, zero matches zero, one matches zero, and star matches either zero or one, okay? So for example, uh, the schema zero star, one zero star, matches the following four strings. With, with respect to a given uh, schema, Colin introduces some, some notation. Uh, the order of a, a schema is the number of non-star symbols uh, within the schema. Uh, so here, the concrete information, the order, is just three. Um, so how many strings of, of length m are, are represented by a schema of, of order h? Just make sure you understand the concept here. So here this schema represents four strings and it has length n are represented by a scheme of order h and, and th this has uh, four strings. H how many in general will a given uh, schema of um, so in this case, each of these are, are, are wild cards, and so uh, uh, it's just 2 to the n minus order h, because those are the number of free positions. And each of these free positions could be 0 or 1. think of the order of a schema as, as measuring kind of how concrete it is. The other uh, property that Holland wants to think about is that um, for a given schema, uh, the defining length dh is the distance between non-star symbols. And so for instance, uh, if you only have zero or one non-star symbols, the distance is one. Here we have two symbols now, and they're one, one apart, likewise here. 
we have two symbols and they're one, two apart. Two symbols or time between the closest. I mean the farthest two, so this is one, two, three apart, and so forth. So it's measuring how big uh, the schema is. So, so these are both measures of size of the schema. Sorry, can you explain this again? Yeah, so, so the defining one, so order and, and, and height are measures of the size of the schema. So you take the farthest two sim the, the farthest two non-star symbols and you count the number of spaces between them. So one, two, three, four. Okay. Um, here we have uh, same five between them. Okay. And so well where we're going with the definitions of order and uh, defining length is we think of uh, the dynamic algorithm as having these three operas, operators, mutation, selection, and crossover. Um, and how are we like, how is a given schema supposed to change? Uh, a given schema would change by, um, how, how would a given schema change? Uh, a given schema changes, might be changed by a mutation in a single, place, so that would depend upon the order. Likewise, if we're going to cross over, the crossover doesn't change any, you know, for the crossover to affect something, it has to fall within the defining link. So we'll, we'll see how that works then. But, uh, Other notation Holm uses for schema is the following. Um, so a given bit string represents a number of schema. So for instance, the bit string one zero is could be matched with these four schema. So if you have a, a bit string of length n, how many schema are in the population are sampled by that, that bit string? Two to the n. Two to the n? And, and why do you say two to the n, which is true? Because it's a binary. Yeah, so for every position we match the character that's there or we match the star, and so there's there's two to the n. And so with a population of L strings, L strings potentially samples between two to the n and L times two to the n schema. Um, idea that genetic algorithms are in some sense implicitly parallel. And the idea is that we imagine the genetic algorithm as operating on, on schema rather than strings. This all seems, you know, when you think about fist strings and, and you, you know, what, what, what is the big picture here? Um, draw for you a population of rabbits. Here's our population of rabbits. Um, these rabbits have um, only, say, four bits of genetic uh, material. Okay, so we'll be in, very conveniently, we can represent rabbits with uh, 16 
you know, 16 possible kinds of rabbits. Now imagine for a moment that um, um, these first two bits code for how long the legs are of the rabbit. You know, maybe roughly you have four values of leg length in rabbits, um, independent before they develop. Okay. Um, so, so these rabbits have four values of leg length. Um, um, maybe this uh, bit codes whether the, the, the rabbit has fur or not. So this is leg length. This is fur. And maybe this controls how aggressive the rabbit is. You know, so maybe long-legged, aggressive rabbits are, are, are kind of successful, uh, and maybe short-legged, timid rabbits are successful. Maybe everybody needs fur. I, I, I don't know. Okay? Uh, but imagine we have this population of rabbits. Now, one way, you know, it's kind of natural from... Um, a personal perspective, a, a perspective of individuals, as we think about evolution is acting on individuals, i.e., you know, it's the fitness of the individual in the population. But another way to think about what is happening, or the way Holland wants to think about it, is the other thing which is going on. You can tell the story about evolution of individuals, but you can also think about the population as a pool of traits. And so, um, Uh, independent to the individuals evolving, we can look at how traits and combinations of traits evolve in the population. So for instance, uh, um, you know, perhaps this is the schema for furry, aggressive uh, rabbits. Now, at this population, you know, this this schema has one element in this population. Um, maybe uh, we have the schema of, of rabbits without fur. Um, there we have a number of individuals which correspond to rabbits without fur. And all the combinations thereof. So in any given population, in addition to just thinking of the individuals of the population, you can think about the population as, as consisting as a set of traits. Um, and then in addition to the population evolving, we can also look at how uh, the traits evolve over time. And this is the idea of the schema theorem. Okay? Um, I don't know how valuable this is, but it, it's fun to least. It's a nice visualization. Um, we can visualize schema as, as hyperplanes. Um, imagine we draw the, the cube. I'm not a great cube drawer, as you're about to see. will correspond to the scheme of zero, zero, zero. Uh, let's say this direction is, this will, this point will correspond to the scheme of zero, one. Uh, this point will correspond to the schema, we'll say zero, one, zero. And this point will correspond to the schema, one, zero, zero. <coughs> so these are, are, are completely determined schema. They're, they're points, uh, but likewise, 
if you now look at a, a face to the hypercube, for instance, this is a face. This face corresponds to, I guess, uh, the last, we're doing a face, so two bits are free, and the only fixed bit here is zero. So that face, for instance, corp zero, zero star corresponds to uh, this face. And likewise, uh, this 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 uh, line here corresponds to the schema zero zero star. So, so you can kind of visualize schema as uh, binary hyperplanes. Okay. Um, Insights. Um, so schema, we, we, we saw that there's a, a, how many schema are there? There's three to the n. Why are there three to the n schema? Because a schema, we have n positions, and each of these positions can be 0, 1, or star, three characters. So it's the three to the n. You can imagine some other more complicated fit set of way of deci des describing traits. Uh, schema are, are, are not <coughs> in the context of, of genetic algorithms. Okay. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and, and prove the schema theorem and then discuss interpretation there. Uh, we'll introduce some, some notation. Um, okay, so we're going to start out the schema theorem with just selection, and then we'll add mutation and crossover. Okay, so H will be the schema with at least one instance in the population at time one. So, for instance, uh, zero zero star has many instances in the population, whereas the schema triple one 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 has no instances in the population. Uh, MTH will be the number of instances of the scheme in the population at time t. So uh, M of this schema, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 instances. Just the number of instances in the population. Uh, the fitness of a string in the population will, at time t will call FT of x. Uh, the mean fitness of the population at time t will designate u t. Uh, the, the fitness of the schema with respect to the population at time t uh, will, will designate mu t h. So what would be the, the fitness of the population? What would mu h t be equal to? Well, using our, our, our notation, uh, how can we pull this out of our, 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 our notation? Um, well, it's the sum over um, uh, individuals which are sampled uh, x, which are sampled by H. 
So we'll say x and h for that notation. And then we just um, sum up their fitnesses, f t of x, divided by m t h. Still a lot of notation. Um, um, so assuming we're using roulette wheel selection, we say that the that, that the number of expected children of an individual X is just uh, its fitness divided by the, the mean of the population fitnesses. Why is that true again? <coughs> how do we how do we argue this? This, if you're programming your, 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 your GA, this is always something kind of interesting. You know, you can kind of see how your GA is evolving if you plot the number of expected offspring of each uh, individual. You can see if, you know, things are, are likely saturated or stagnated by looking at uh, the number of mean offspring expected for each individual. You know, if all individuals are having one offspring, Kind of like random search. If if uh, one individual has has a number of offspring approaching n, uh, it may be stagnating. So how do we show this? Let's let's review how selection works. Um, <clears throat> so we have um, the population. We have n individuals. Well, what's the what's the, how does selection work? Um, so let's say we have a population of n individuals. We calculate for each individual. Um, the, the probability of, of selection. What's the, the probability of an individual being selected in one spin of the rollout wheel? Fitness proportional selection. So you're, you're selected with, with probability, pro with your fitness proportional to everybody else in the individual, so the fitness of Individual x is just uh, well in this notation, f t of x over um, the sum of f t of x. That's its. That's the probability of individual x being uh, selected. So when we do the selection step, we then do n selection steps. So how many children do we expect an individual to have then? N selection steps. So it's just uh, N times P of X, which is equal to N times F T of X divided by the sum of F T of X. So how do we go from here to here? divide through by n, we lose n from the top, there's n individuals so the population, so this is the mean population, so this becomes mu of t, and then we have it. So, so the number of offspring uh, in fitness proportional selection um, in the standard GA where you have n individuals is just um, the ratio of your fitness to the population mean fitness. Okay. 
So now we want to make the same type of argument for schema. We want to calculate the expected number of, of instances of a given schema in the next generation in the population. <coughs> so now we have the exact same thing again, uh, except with schema. So now we look at the expected number of schema, that's the MTH in the next generation. Well, it's the, the mean, it's the sum of the, the mean fitness of those. Uh, each individual x in the population we've just argued will have f t of x over u t children, and so we'll check that for each of the schema and sum that, and that'll be the expected number of children in the population. Um, and then we just rewrite this with the observation that. Uh, The population, uh, the expected number of children of schema H is just the mean fitness of that schema, as we defined before, divided by the mean fitness of the population times the number of individuals. Okay. So The, the observation is made here is, is the population, you know, if we think of the way our, our GA works is we don't sit there and, and pull out schema and calculate their fitnesses and do roulette wheel uh, selection on, on schema. Um, but just like it's the case for the individual, uh, the population of uh, different schema is controlled in the same fashion, okay? So the, the, the proportion of the scheme in the next generation in the population is proportional to the fitness, even though that's something that we don't calculate. So what we're saying here is we have this result where you know the number of children of an individual is just its the mean, its mean fitness uh, relative to that of the population. So you can think of the individuals as, as evolution is happening on these individuals. But likewise, you can think about it as happening on individual traits, because if we have the same uh, expected result. Okay. Questions so far? Okay, so what we've done is we have the first part of the schema theorem. Uh, now is, is this where things get, I don't know, I don't know it's tricky to word, but we have to make lots of assumptions. Uh, suppose uh, the schema H remains above average, above the average fitness for some period of time. So we have some schema H and its fitness remains above the population fitness by a constant t, so let's say from the beginning of the population from, from then on. Thus, uh, what we've, we've just said in, in words is, is that we have uh, this property and um, uh, this should be, um, be an upper bound. Um, and so what we see is this schema uh, in the population MH, if we have this assumption, uh, which is a very strong assumption, uh, is experiencing exponential growth. 
I, if somehow the, a given schema can remain above average fitness by just some, you know, maybe it's above average fitness by a lot at the beginning, but maybe less in the end, but as long as it's always above by some amount C, well then, uh, after T generations, uh, uh, you'll have one plus C of T instances in expectation in your population. It's a very strong assumption. I mean, even if the scheme is fixed and you have a, a finite population, uh, you know, it can never, obviously, if you have a finite population, you can't exponentially grow forever. So, for example, if you have a finite population, you'll eventually take over uh, the population. And so instead, you have a logistic curve. You know, it starts out as ascension exponential, but obviously, if you have nearly all the population, um, you have to trail off. Um, but the basic idea is, if you're willing to make those assumptions about the given schema of remaining above average fitness for a number of populations, um, then a given schema will grow exponentially or decay exponentially in expectation according to their fitness. Um, well, the conditions are exactly what we just supposed, that we suppose it actually does remain above this. So presumably, uh, the <coughs> amount of this schema in the population compared to the total population size has to be relatively small because it's growing exponentially until it becomes logistic. Um, so we'll, we'll see the other steps, but this is really the, the main reason why Holland wants to say what a GA does is good. So he wants to say a GA is good um, because you think of this population as, as consisting of a number of traits or schema. And how long should you spend at a given schema exploring around it? Uh, well, in analogy to the bandit problem, you should spend an exponential amount of time according to the if you, you should spend an exponential amount of time exploiting versus exploring. And so this is exactly what happens with schema. A given schema potentially is in the population uh, what am I saying? Um, a given schema takes over the population exponentially. Um, we'll come back and, and, and discuss all these other functions a, a bit more. But let's 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 understand a little bit more about what Holland's trying to say. Um, so if we are making an analogy to the bandit problem, what what are what are the bandit arms here? The banded arms are, are, are competing schemas. So for instance, uh, we say two schema com compete if uh, if they match concrete symbols in a given position and they have star symbols in the other position. So for instance, these four schema compete. Okay. If 
we look at our population of rabbits, for instance, maybe this is furriness, maybe this is a aggressiveness. Uh, this completely partitions the, the subspace, the, the, the space of rabbits. Um, so every given rabbit is either not furry, non-aggressive, or furry and aggressive. Each of these schema then correspond to one single K-arm banded problem, i.e., either it, you know, we, we consider the, the traits of, you know, non-furry, non non-aggressive versus non-furry aggressive. Um, there's four possibilities here. So these these are all competing. But likewise, uh, maybe this represents the first order bit of, you know, we have also competing, for instance, at the same time as is is one 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 star 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 one zero star 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 zero one star 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 zero zero star star star. This is another set of competing schema. In the next generation, the amount of each of these schema in the in the next generation is controlled exactly by the little equation that we just proved. Uh, same thing, the expected number of schema of these at the same time. So the idea is that each, you have many potential schema in the population where these correspond to traits and possibly combinations of traits and they're simultaneously competing. And So this is the, the notion of, of the GA being implicitly parallel. <coughs> it's at least many individuals in the population, but we're also at the same time, uh, selection is simultaneously playing this um, evaluation game on schema too. Okay. Um, Of course, schema which are very large, either in the sense of order or distance, aren't processed. Um, uh, so far, what we've done with the schema term is we've only considered selection. What, what is the influence of, of crossover and mutation? Um, so let SC denote the probability that a given schema um, will survive a single point crossover, and PC is the probability of crossover. So. The probability that schema H will uh, survive a crossover operation is just this. Let's let's see why. So it's not guaranteed to to destroy, but so it's, it's hard to tell red from black. But if you look at this this schema with a, a defining length of seven. Um, now recall the crossover operator. If crossover occurs with probability P of C, we might be fine. The schema might not be destroyed, i.e., it might fall into one of these regions. If, if we cross over here, the scheme is left alone. However, if we cross over here, 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 or here, which there's seven such positions, uh, 
the schema may be destroyed depending on what the other uh, individual looks like that we're crossing over with. Um, this depends, of course, on that individual, but since we're just, we'll just assume that it's destroyed and, and, and prove, uh, give a lower bound here. Okay. So this is a probability that it'll be destroyed. This is a probability of that cross source. The probability it survives is one minus that. Okay. Questions so far? Let's look at mutation now. Yes? I don't really get what you mean by destroying a scheme. I mean, like splitting up this small. OK, so the idea on this schema theorem is, is that we measure the expected number of, of occurrences of the scheme in the next generation of the population. And the hope is, is that it predicts more than one generation ahead of time. Now, what we first did is we showed that selection uh, predicts how many, if we only have selection, that predicts how many schema will be in the next generation. But crossover mutation potentially destroy a, a schema. I.e., suppose we've selected an individual, it has this schema, if we only have selection, we're done. But we have a chance of, of mutation or crossover changing the individual. If the individual changes, it will no longer sample the schema necessarily. Okay? So if when we, and what could destroy it? Well, if we crossed over here, it wouldn't hurt the schema. Why is that? Oh, because uh, it doesn't matter what those are. It doesn't matter what these are. So no matter what gets replaced, you know, if we, you know, this individual, this part will carry on into the next offspring no matter what, if we cross over here, for instance. But if we cross over here, this gets split into two. One individual will get this half, one individual will get that half. And so this schema won't necessarily be in the population anymore unless we're extremely lucky. Okay? Questions? So we'll see a similar uh, negative effect with mutation. help me out here. Um, so, so once more, S and M will, will denote the probability that schema H will survive mutation. P and M here is the probability of mutation. So, um, where, where did this formula come from? How, how, how would you uh, compute this? Why does this make sense? So we just have OH positions. As long as none of these bits change, we're fine. Uh, mutation will potentially will, will change a bit if mutation occurs. So then it flips the bit, and it'll be destroyed. Probability of none of these flipping is just 1 minus the probability over the number of positions. Okay. Yes? Uh, I that's actually, is that actually a, a lower bound since for the wildcard position in between? <coughs> no, no, no. This is, uh, unlike the other one, this is, is exact because the schema, um, 
doesn't matter what happens in here or here. It's only these that matter because the scheme is one zero zero. The scheme is unchanged. Uh, this individual still, you know, who, as long as these things, as long as these five positions don't change, this schema will still sample whatever the offspring looks like. Exactly, uh, but uh, the OH counts the five positions, even though they're, they're three wild cards. Yes, yes. It, the OH is counting only the number of non wild card positions. Mm -hmm. So it counts, OH is the number of non wild card positions, so it's just these five locations. But that's more rigid than, than you need because it's, it's obviously assuming that it, it stays the same for the, all those five positions, even though. Uh, that there is uh, possibility for variance on the wildcard positions uh, without violating the scheme. Yes, so that's why it's exactly this. I am, I'm missing what you're saying a little bit. I'm, 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 saying, I'm saying it's a lower band. Uh, could it be considered a lower band or any of that? Of that? No, no, it's the other, the other one was a lower band. This is so. So here's what happens. So wave mutation works is at each position we flip a random coin of p of m. Uh, if if p of m, if if our, our bias coin turns heads with probability of p of m, we flip a bit. So we flip a coin at this position. Maybe it changes or it doesn't change. Whether it changes or doesn't change has no difference to the scheme of being in the population of the next generation because any character can be here. However, if we if we flip a coin here and it changes, then we're we're potentially then the individual is definitely not in the population because the bit changes. Likewise here, likewise here. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Likewise here. Likewise here. So if any one of these five bits changes, we're in trouble. What's the probability of those five bits uh, not changing? Well, it's just that the head coming up the right way five times, and that probability is exactly that. Okay. If, if something's unclear, ask me during the interval. Okay. Um, so the schema theorem is just combining now the, the the, the positive uh, probability, you know, the schema theorem has the positive force and the negative force. The positive force is selection. The negative force says our, with respect to the schema theorem, our, our mutation and crossover. Uh, so the, prob the number of individuals in the next generation of schema H will be at least um, uh, this, which we first proved, and then times the probability of the schema surviving both crossover and mutation. Uh, it's a lower bound since uh, it was a lower bound for crossover. And now we're just writing out those probabilities. Here I've substituted SC in. Here I've sub substituted EM in. And then uh, not really necessary, but maybe it's a little more intuitive. If we assume mutation is very small, which it usually is, this term uh, looks instead like this term because by a first order Taylor series expansion, this probability is essentially uh, the order of H minus A of M. Okay. Let's think about uh, Holland's statement here. Uh, take a 10 minute break and come back and, and, and discuss this further after interval. But I will take a quick question if there's something I can clarify at this point before break. Okay, uh, let's take a break for 10 minutes. Okay. <clears throat>